Okay, agriculture. Uh, Stephen, Stephen emphasised that in growth, uh, structural change is all important. And of course, the, the position of agriculture is unusual in this respect in most low-income countries, in as much as it begins as being one of the largest sectors, almost certainly the largest single employer of labour, and usually having a GDP component that's a quarter of the economy or larger. And yet, of course, as growth takes place, agriculture will become smaller relatively, not absolutely, of course. And in the process of successful growth, where do the factors of production for the other sectors come from? Well, as far as labor and quite a lot of capital, although we're never quite sure how much, it's coming out of the agriculture sector to allow growth in those other sectors. So we have this great paradox for agriculture, which is as countries become richer, they become less agricultural, but the only way you get out of agriculture is to have agricultural growth. So the faster you grow, the smaller you become relatively in life. So um, there you see the two big issues that we focus on in, in the growth program. One is the big macro issue of how we get um, agriculture to contribute to these structural changes that we want to see. And secondly, we have the more micro concerns about how do we get that increased agricultural production and above all, the raised productivity to factors of production, to labor and to land that allow transitions to take place. Okay, um, now look. The questions that we have for the agriculture program are under three headings, um, and these correspond to, 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 to the broad division. So the first broad division is captured in this first set of questions, which is about the overall nature of agricultural growth and its relation to the rest of the economy. And there we're asking questions about what do we know about patterns of agricultural growth, about the composition of crops, the scale of production, the types of technology that are used in the agriculture sector, and how that growth affects growth in other parts of the economy. We're interested, of course, to know what are the costs of failure in agricultural development. If our agriculture grows more slowly, how much of a break is that on the growth of other uh, sectors? We've also included under the macro thing a question about the, the politics, the, the, the policy choices that take place in agriculture, recognizing that probably more than most sectors, policy for agriculture is often extraordinarily perverse. And two questions that, that, that always attract our attention in agriculture in low-income countries, how do we avoid, on the one hand, the trap of negative protection that was so widespread, for example, in the 1970s, but you can't say that it's completely eliminated from the landscape. The trap of negative protection, um, implicit high taxation of agriculture that was a major deterrent to investment and innovation on the one hand, or the alternative trap which typically awaits middle-income countries, but it's potentially there for low-income countries, and that is a populist politics in which agricultural handouts become a major part of the political debate in the country. Um, the case that's referred to, uh, alluded to there, uh, Malun et al., is the case of India, which is leaving its low-income status, but India has got itself now into the position where the subsidies on irrigation, water, rural power and fertilizer are now costing the Indian government more than its entire public education budget. Everybody knows in India that that doesn't make a lot of sense, but politically it does make a lot of sense. So we're interested in those kinds of questions. Now, the other big set of questions were about raising production and productivity, the micro aspects of what goes on with agriculture. And here we have two sets of questions. And the first one says, why is there so little market engagement, particularly of small farmers with markets in, in Africa? And why in particular do we have such a low use of external inputs 
improve seed, fertilizer, agrochemicals, sometimes machinery, which could make the difference in raising levels of productivity from the very low levels that they typically are in productivity on use of land and productivity in use of labor. And there are all kinds of hypotheses about what the reason is in particular circumstances. I mean, one possibility is it's just high transport costs. If you have high transport costs, the farm gate cost of inputs can be very high. The farm gate value of sold produce is correspondingly reduced. And it may be that the external inputs under high transport costs are simply not economically justified. And Doug Gollin and, and, and Rogerson on this uh, have looked at this in the case of Uganda, for example, claiming that this is a major uh, drawback on Ugandan growth and the very high costs of rural transport that are seen through much of rural Uganda. Are we facing problems of uninsured risks? And we know on some recent work from northern Ghana that the biggest single thing that seemed to deter farmers from investing and innovating in northern Ghana were the uninsured risks, and that when you offered them with randomized trials access to a weather-based insurance, uh, farmers invested more in that particular case. So is this one of our big issues which is, is facing us, and if so, what are the instruments that we need to, to overcome that? We have the long-standing debates on, on property rights. Uh, how secure are collective, long-standing, traditional arrangements of land tenure in terms of farmers' security for long-term investment and conservation of resources? And there's a terrific amount of literature on that, but we're still not absolutely sure what the answer to that question is. And last but not least on that, and I'm sure there are, there are one or two other hypotheses we could add, is the lack of use of external input still remaining, even in a world of mobile phones and so on, one of lack of credible information or information communicated to farmers in credible forms? Uh, what do we know about rural innovation systems, about extension systems, and so on? Now, last set of questions is looking again at the micro area and just one specific area. And this is one specific part of productivity. Why so little irrigation in sub-Saharan Africa? Um, it's rather strange how rarely this question bounces around in the debates that I'm in, given that you know, the, the stock facts are very dramatic. Four or five percent of land in sub-Saharan Africa is irrigated. The comparable statistics for Asia are 30, 35 percent of land irrigated. Now, okay, the physical conditions are different, but even on the most conservative estimates of the irrigable land in sub-Saharan Africa, it is at least three times the area which is irrigated at the moment. So why on earth are we not seeing more irrigation? What's, what's holding it back? And, you know, is this down to underlying uh, technical and economic relations embedded in... in, in levels of development of being, being low-income countries where we still can't go for um, irrigation investment that pays off? Is it down to inappropriate policy? And we know that historically, large-scale public investments in irrigation in Africa, with a few honorable exceptions, have been uh, terrible failures, uh, great wastes of money, uh, schemes that have never worked in the way that they were meant to and have certainly never paid off the public investments? Or is it when we're thinking about private levels of uh, irrigation on smaller schemes, are we running into problems of collective action, of the inability of groups of farmers to run collective schemes for irrigation and to use the water appropriately? And that's the last of the agricultural questions. All right. Very, very good, uh, Steve. Thank you very much.